we're going to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. We're getting uh, to the closing verses of this letter. Um, Peter's first letter. And uh, we appreciate Peter. His ministry, what is recorded about him. Um, his openness. His failures and stumbles. Uh, but his faithfulness. And uh, here he is writing this letter, a man who will subsequently, uh, we don't uh, have a record in scripture, but tradition says that he was martyred along with uh, most of the other original followers of Christ. Uh, he started this letter and he's going to finish it in a similar way. You come back to chapter 1 and in verse 3, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. And uh, that living hope assures us, verse 4, of obtaining an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you, he writes his writers. And then he proceeds in verse 5 to say, it's sure and guaranteed because we are protected by the power of God who our faith in him and his provision for us for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So we were born again to that living hope. And that living hope includes the inheritance he has prepared for us in glory and then his divine protection assures that nothing will keep us from realizing entering into that inheritance and all the glory that God has prepared for those who love him. That immediately moved him in verses 6 and 7 to talk about their immediate situation, which is that of suffering and trials. Uh, verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, in the settled assurance of the promises of God and his protecting power. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. And this is the, just the refining of your faith, the purifying, like gold, uh, to prepare us for what God has planned for us. And when we come to the end of the letter, uh, picking up with uh, these closing verses, he's going to really bring us back to that original emphases and theme. And he's mentioned the suffering. And he's going to talk about the glory and the work of God in firmly planting us and his ongoing grace, which is his provision to see us safely through the trials of this life. In verse 8, he talked about the devil. Yeah, we already looked at that. And uh, that was the first time he mentioned the devil in this letter. Even though, obviously, the devil is the spiritual entity and power behind the troubles and trials. Working with the sinful desires of fallen people to oppose God and his people. You have the work of the devil. Um, and we just need to be alert. He is a fearsome enemy and opponent, but we have a God who protects and cares for us. But that doesn't mean we can be careless. And we noted uh, some of those matters. And God's plan, as we uh, move down through verse 9, we're to resist the devil and are encouraged to know other believers are suffering also. 
So we ought to think that this is some strange thing or we are being singled out. But the same experiences of suffering, verse 9, are being accomplished in your brethren who are in the world. Uh, Particularly fellow Jewish believers, but it would be true as we look around the world. We live in a world, as we've noted, that is in opposition to God and God's people. And so there is the constant struggles of one kind and another. But God's plan and intention Verse 10, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you to him be the dominion forever and ever. Um, So the full confidence of what he said at the beginning of the letter is true as he's walked us through the letter and uh, some of the trials he's talked about. Uh, We want to conclude with a reminder. And again, the way he puts it, after you've suffered for a little while, these things will take place. And the word order is a little different uh, than what we have in our English Bible. They sometimes uh, rearrange uh, the sentences in their uh, order to flow a little, maybe they see better. Uh, But the word order here is literally, it starts out with what we have uh, after you have suffered a little while. The first line in the Greek text is, Peter wrote it was, it has a conjunction, but the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus after you have suffered for a little while. So he draws attention first to God, his work, his grace, uh, his sovereign call that brought us to his salvation. Uh, And that includes that call was to eternal glory. Then he puts the suffering in there. As we often talk about, we keep our focus first on God and what he has promised to those who love him. And that keeps the suffering, no matter how intense it might become, what particular form it might take, it's kept in its proper perspective. Nothing will alter or frustrate God's plan For us as his children. So in that we can have settled confidence. Sure uh, joy. Uh, Not that the trials aren't painful. But the joy is knowing. This is the hand of God. Working his purposes for me. To bring me. To the glory that he has promised. So let's talk about it in the order that Peter wrote it first, the God of all grace. Focusing on God, um, his character, he's the source and giver of grace. Uh, Grace, that unmerited favor, um, that sufficiency he supplies for us to live Uh, as he would have us live in every situation. Remember Paul's trials and suffering, the thorn in the flesh uh, that he had from Satan, and he came to appreciate what? When God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. I won't remove the trial. I won't remove the thorn. But the assurance, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Uh, So with that, Paul can say now, I can rejoice in the suffering. I have been reminded again of God's grace and reminded by that grace that this is his purpose. And he is working it in my life. So God's grace covers every area of our lives. 
all of our need. Uh, he talked about this grace in giving spiritual gifts back in chapter 4, verse 10. As each one has received a gift, and we know that that is, uh, at the root of that word gift is the word grace. It's a grace gift. Employing it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And God bestows his grace upon us so that we might, as the recipients enabled by his grace, function in such a way that we will be a help and encouragement and part of the building up of other believers, even as um, we go through trials. Not always at the same time, not always of the same kind. But it's God's grace. You come back to chapter 1 of 1 Peter. And you know what he says at the end of verse 2? His prayer and desire for them. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Now they've experienced God's saving grace when they placed their faith in Christ. And uh, he mentioned that in verse 3, which we read, that God caused us to be born again. But he wants that grace to be their ongoing provision. Grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. That sustaining grace, that enabling grace, that is God's provision for us to endure and go through trials, go through suffering, go through difficulty, and not be overwhelmed by it. Uh, not to be crushed by it. Doesn't mean he takes all the pain out of it. Wouldn't be a trial if that was the case. But he assures us that his grace is his provision for us. Uh, down in verse 13, if you're still in ver uh, chapter 1. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Gird your minds for action. Uh, in our thinking... We have to have uh, prepared ourselves in the way we think, with disciplined thinking, prepared for action. Keep sober. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So you see that pervading emphasis on God's grace. And the culmination of his outpouring of grace for us. Um, be absorbed in your mind with thinking of the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What will that grace be? That'll be that transforming grace that brings these physical bodies into conformity with the body of his glory. And a reminder that the sufferings of this present time, what he said in verse 6 of chapter 1, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various styles. And the context, keep your mind disciplined and focused on the fullness of the grace that will be brought to you when Jesus Christ brings us into the glory of his presence, uh, then we will be transformed. All suffering, all trials will be over. God's purpose in using them in our lives will be complete. We have all eternity then to enjoy the presence of God and the fullness of his glorifying grace. So everything's put into perspective. Uh, and that is a strengthening enablement for us, just like it was for Paul when he was reminded by God of the sufficiency of his grace, uh, even in a trial which seemed and was so great for the Apostle Paul. You come back to chapter 5. The God of all grace, who called you to his gl eternal glory in Christ. That call of God. He called you. 
It's what we refer to as the effectual call of God. It is the call that is always effective. In other words, when God calls, you will answer. It always results in salvation. It's used a little differently in the gospel. We read a verse in our earlier study today. Many are called, few are chosen. There, the word called is used in the gospels in a general sense of an invitation to everyone. Contrasted with the electing choice of God. But in the epistle, it's always used in the context of God's electing work. Choosing. That call is the specific call that goes to the elect and results in drawing them to salvation in Christ. The God who called you. Come back to chapter 1 of Peter. And we read verse 13. And you come to verse 15, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. God called us with the intention we be like him. Not uh, we can't become deity because one of the uh, unchangeable attributes of deity is eternality. And uh, we had a beginning We'll have no ending by his grace. But he called us to be like him in his character. He is a holy God, separated and set apart from sin. We are to be a holy people, separated and set apart from sin. As uh, Peter writes in the uh, second letter, We have become partakers of the divine nature so that the character of God is to be manifest and produced in us. That's a result of his call. He called us. Chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race. Remember, this is addressed to Jewish believers. They are a chosen race because God had called the Jews. And they become the elect remnant, those who have believed in Christ. And uh, so they do represent the nation. And the uh, remnant in the nation that is experiencing God's salvation. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellences of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that's true for uh, all of us as believers. In the last part of that, we have all been called out of darkness into his light, his marvelous light. That call is a transforming call uh, that brings us to salvation. Back up to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're not going to trace down all the uses of call. But uh, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation, accomplished through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. The work of the Spirit in setting us apart and our faith in the truth. Uh, It was for this he called you. There's our word again. Through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know the connection here. And the focus, the call from the beginning as a result of God choosing us, was to glory. And us gaining the glory, as he says, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, what an awesome uh, work that God has done in calling us to himself. 
that call includes the successful completion of God's plan for those that he calls. Uh, this stress that he began and now he's reminding what he includes becomes important because sometimes when the trials and difficulties and pressures come, if we haven't disciplined our minds in keeping them focused where they should be, we begin to become unsettled, like something's wrong. And, uh, you know, I can't see any good in this, and it seems God's abandoned me, and I don't think I'm going to make it. Um, I remind myself, Lord, you know I'm overwhelmed. Some of what we've been uh, studying in some of the Psalms, and they seem that you can come to that point. But what sustains you through it is God's not overwhelmed. In his call, when he called me to salvation in Christ, was a call, as you come back to chapter 5, verse 10, he called you, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus. Uh, he's called us to the glory that is his eternal glory. So I can't fail to be there. Um, we just have a taste of the glory in the salvation we have experienced and we don't minimize that in any way, but um, that's just a taste. Paul says the difference in the glory we're going to experience is like a kernel, remember in 1 Corinthians 15, that's planted and you get this beautiful plant that comes out of it. We're just the kernel, but we know something of the glory and blessings that God has brought to us in salvation, making us new within. But this is just a taste of what God has planned for us. He's called us to His, His eternal glory. I mean, there's nothing more glorious than that. That we, throughout eternity, should share in the glory of His presence. Uh, back in chapter 1, verse 7. So that the proof of your faith, these are our trials and testing, more precious than gold which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Praise, glory, honor the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, the best is uh, yet before us. Uh, chapter 4, verse 13. The, to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. You note, not after the suffering, but the degree you share the sufferings of Christ, suffering because of our identification with Christ, keep on rejoicing so that at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. Um, and, be, you know, when you suffer because of your identification with Christ, uh, it's a blessing. Why? Because the spirit of glory in God rests upon you. It is a blessing for us as the children of God, uh, the followers of Christ who have committed to take up our cross and follow him, uh, to be identified with him in suffering. And the spirit of glory, that's just a reminder. We are privileged to be treated with the rejection that our Savior was. And that's just... A reminder that um, the spirit of glory, that spirit will, which will bring about that ultimate transformation. Important for us to realize. We see the world around us uh, descending more and more uh, into its uh, 
by our rebellion against God. That will uh, result in more and more opposition to believers because of their stand for truth. Um, serious matters. It could become more intense for you in your responsibility. We live in this world. The more the world becomes open and more overt in its opposition to us, uh, the more difficult it may become. We don't know how difficult it will become before the Lord comes to remove the church before the worst of times. Uh, but the world becomes more open in its opposition to anything biblical and to the people who would promote it. Um, in one of our states, I was just reviewing an article I had put in my desk at home, and uh, it was in October 2014 in one of our uh, cities where they summoned the messages of all that the preachers had preached touching on subjects that are currently in the news. That went to courts, and I believe... Uh, that was withdrawn, but you see where they want to go. Uh, we're reminded that we are committed. That's why we gird our minds for action because we are committed to follow Christ and be faithful to Him. That's not conditional upon how open the world is to allow us that freedom. The more they close in and uh, try to shut down that freedom, the more suffering might become. Uh, might end up closing certain opportunities for work. Well, you can hold your religious convictions, but, and it's the but. So a reminder that he has called us to his eternal glory in Christ. So nothing's going to frustrate that. And you know what? God's in charge. Uh, you know, you watch what's going on, you read what's happening, you watch the news, and you say, I can't believe it. Is this really happening? But by the same token, we're, uh, we're disappointed, but we're not surprised, are we? Well, in one sense, <laughs> surprised that it really comes to this this quickly. But in the other sense, the world is just manifesting its condition. Hearts which are deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. And how important it is that they hear the truth. Come back to Romans 8. Romans 8. And look at the very familiar passage we come to often in verse 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called. There we are. Those who are called according to his purpose. And we love God because he first loved us. And in that love of grace, he called us uh, to the salvation in Christ. We are called according to his purpose. And what is his purpose for us? Those whom he foreknew. He also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that we would be the firstborn among many brethren. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? You'll note the last... Well, Part of verse 30, those that he justified, he also glorified. It's a done deal. Um, we can write about this as a past thing because God's plan for us that he has called to salvation in his son includes our glorification. So that's in the context where, what do we say to things? If God is for us, who's against us? 
So no matter how open and overt the opposition of the world may become, God's plan for us cannot be frustrated. That's our confidence. That's our assurance. It's not that we will never suffer. It's not that we'll never go through trials and difficulties. It's none of those things can alter God's plan. And then that beautiful section, very beginning, there's verse 34. Who's the one who condemns? Christ Jesus, he who died, who was raised, is at the right hand of God who intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. And that's consistent with uh, what we have in one of the Psalms as he quotes. In all these things, verse 34, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. So I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers, height, depth, any other created thing. Remember Colossians 1, angels are created beings uh, as well. So the forces of the devil and the demons, uh, nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, so we are a people safe, secure. Well, you're in Romans 8, verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is revealed to us. And the whole creation is moving toward that. Because ultimately, when all said and done, we're going to rule and reign with Christ in a world on an earth that the curse has been removed, lifted. Um, and then we'll see something of uh, the potential there for the display of the glory God intended at the beginning. So all of this is what reinforces us. And you know, like so many areas, it's important. Uh, we talk about these things when we're not in them so that we can be prepared for them when they come. One of the discouraging things is sometimes we study the scripture and we're not in that kind of situation, then that kind of situation comes and all of a sudden we're all over the place. We are to fix our hearts and minds on the truth of scripture so that we are prepared for what is coming what may come. Uh, we are not, quote, blindsided. Um, we are ready. Now, well, I don't know what's coming tomorrow. I, well, I don't need to know, to know that. I need to know my heart and mind are girded and prepared for action and commitment to follow Jesus Christ. And not be shaken by what man may do to me. And that's where we are to be as a church. Now, easy to talk about it now. Then the trouble comes and all of a sudden, oh, what's happening? This is, I never expected this. I didn't. Well, wait a minute. What did we spend all this time studying the scripture for? Um, these truths, uh, they grip our hearts in a more, more real way in a more pertinent way, if I can say it that way, when we're in the midst of the tribulation. Now we talk about tribulation as, you know, something we could go through. Um, different if we get arrested for our faith or you get fired from your job because you cannot promote that which you believe is contrary to the word of God or things like that. Um, but we are not living our lives expecting the support of the world in our commitment and following Jesus Christ. Uh, come back to 1 Peter. In verse 10, as he goes on, he called you to his eternal glory in Christ. Uh, 
And uh, that's the emphasis here. Um, you know, it's in Christ all this takes place. And when we, by God's grace, His sovereign choice, His call, we placed our faith in Christ, and if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature. Old things are passed away, new things have come. Uh, he called us to his eternal glory in Christ. And uh, we are those who are in Christ. Uh, we abide in him, he abides in us. Uh, that's all we have in him. So then we go on. Verse 10, now we have what we have as the first sentence. You see how the Spirit has directed Peter to put the emphases. First, he talks about the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in grace, Christ. After you have suffered for a little while, I'm not saying it's wrong to put it there, there's a, you know, we rearrange translation of going from one language to another, but you see, um, the attention that the Spirit directs Peter to give to this. And verse 10 began with that conjunction, but, we don't have it recorded, but the God of all grace who called you. In contrast, with verse 9, you resist the devil, you know the experiences of suffering are being accomplished in your brethren, but the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered for a little while, Again, a reminder, the suffering is for a little while. Um, we saw that when we read in uh, chapter 1 of uh, Peter. Even though, verse 6, for a little while you've been distressed by various trials. You say, well, uh, necessarily a little while. I had an article I had put in, I clipped out from a history text of uh, a woman um, several hundred years ago uh, in prison for, what, 37 years in a dungeon. They kept offering her freedom if she would renounce Christ. No, no. Well, that a little while? I mean, this is my life. Um, but it's not. This is just a little while in my eternal life. So this will pass, you think, now, uh, two or three hundred years later, I forget the exact date of the article, uh, she's regretting, saying, boy, that was a long time. And you know what? In another 500 million years, that little time is getting to be a smaller portion of it, isn't it? Um, easy for me to see it in someone else. So reminder here. After you've suffered for a little while, come back to uh, 2 Corinthians, which we studied recently, and I'm sure it's just fresh in your mind. 2, Timothy, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we looked in uh, Romans chapter 8, Paul made a similar expression. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, we'll pick up with... Uh, Verse 16, therefore we do not lose heart. Though our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed day by day. And we saw when we studied, you get over to chapter 11, and Paul lays out some of the things that he has gone through in his suffering. And imagine uh, the condition his body is in. And he sees the deterioration taking place. But we don't lose heart. The outer man is decaying. It's going down. But the inner man is getting renewed day by day. We should be growing and are growing more mature, stronger, spiritually. For, note this, momentary, light affliction is producing for us an eternal, in contrast to momentary, weight 
in contrast to light affliction, a weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. Oh, there's no comparing the momentary light affliction with the eternal weight of glory. Um, there's no comparison. Now the key, which Peter has said, when we gird our mind for action, similar thing with a different uh, analogy, while we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. We have our eyes fixed where, what's Peter been emphasizing? On the glory, the eternal glory. You know, it's when the pressure comes in and all of a sudden my eyes drop down and I look at the circumstances, the situation. Perhaps as Paul talks about, uh, my body's breaking down. How much more of this can it take? Uh, well, it doesn't matter. Uh, I've got my eyes set on what is not seen. And that's an eternal weight of glory. Uh, the discouraging thing for us are the things that we look around. Uh, that we're going through now that we can see that is happening to us and the pain and suffering and trial and difficulty it brings. Uh, but we don't uh, live our lives focused on what we see. Uh, so he went on to talk about uh, what we anticipate in chapter 5 and uh, what God has prepared for us and um, verse 8, that well-known verse, or verse 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. We are good courage. I say rather to be at absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. I mean, you know, uh, that doesn't mean we want to die a painful death. Um, I hope I preach my last sermon and have a heart attack. No suffering, no difficulty, and uh, no wasted energy because I got the last sermon out. Um, we all would like to have, quote, an easy death. My dad had a heart attack uh, cutting the lawn one time in New Jersey. Um, they brought him back with the shocks to the chest and everything. And uh, he said, I opened my eyes. I'm in a hospital. He said, I never knew what happened. He said, when I die, that's the way I want to go. But you know, they brought him back and then he had to suffer through years of cancer and pain and suffering. Um, you know, we don't get to pick that. But God's sovereign. Do you think it matters now? No. We look at the things which are not seen. Uh, you realize permeating the scripture is a very similar emphasis for God's people. But... One of the tools of the devil is to get our eyes off of the goal. Come back to 1 Peter 5. After you have suffered for a little while. Um, here's what God will do. The God of all grace who called you to his own glory will himself this is what he will do. He will perfect, confirm, strengthen, establish you. Um, it is the work of God. Uh, this is the certainty of what God will do, even through the trials and the difficulties. Uh, he is refining us. He is not intending to destroy us, even if our life ends as Paul, as a martyr. That's part of the plan. The refining work was done. Uh, you'll note what he says. He himself will perfect. It means to equip or prepare something or someone. 
can be fixing something. Uh, verb we've uh, talked about in other contexts. It could be used in a medical sense of fixing a broken arm. Um, so perfect in the sense of uh, putting it into the condition it needs to be in. Uh, he'll bring to completion the work that he has begun. Uh, this is part of the gifts that he has given uh, in grace. In uh, chapter 4, verse 10 of 1 Peter, back in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 10, Paul said there to the Ephesians that Christ had bestowed the gifts upon us as believers to the church what, for the equipping of the saints. And it's that basic word we have, the equipping of the saints, rendering them fit, uh, bringing them to be all they need to be. Uh, uh, that's part of the process. Some of the things we look at as negative, destructive, as Paul looked at his thorn in the flesh. That's why he prayed to God three times to remove it. It's a hindrance. It's a negative. Then God remind him, no. That's why I can use you to such a great way. Uh, to a greater extent than I otherwise would. Well, you can see it's part of that uh, fitting and bringing us to that point of uh, assurance in our situation. He'll perfect, he'll confirm. Verb means to make firm or solid, stabilizing something uh, so that it won't totter or fall over. You know, sometimes if something's happened, they'll say, well, the first thing we have to do is stabilize the foundation. Um, so have to stabilize the support here. This is part of what God is doing. He's confirming us. He's making us more firm, more solid, uh, so that we'll have a stability. And believers who have been through trials, uh, been through the fire, so to speak, uh, have a stability. Uh, you talk to believers who have been through persecution uh, in other countries, and they uh, manifest that. And they, wow, how did they do that? Well, they came through difficulty and trial. But God's at work in it to strengthen us, to stabilize us. Um, come back to Romans 16. We don't have time to look at uh, all the references that uh, refer to this. But look at Romans chapter 16. Verse 25. Now to him who is able to establish you. There we are. Uh, to make you firm, solid, stable. Um, you know, these different pictures. We're not to be carried about by every wind of doctrine like children. Uh, he's strengthening our character so that we are unmovable. We follow Christ wherever it takes us, where, uh, whatever it involves. We are committed to be faithful to the word, whatever uh, is uh, the idea. He is the one who's able to establish you, according to my gospel, uh, set you firm. Part of what he's using. We not only rejoice in the fact God's doing this, but sometimes we want to tell him how to do it and how not to do it. Um, and nothing wrong. Paul prayed that the Lord would remove the thorn in the flesh. But we also want to pray according to his will. Because we don't pray to tell God what he has to do. But we can bring the desires of our heart to him. But you know, if he chooses not to remove it, I accept that it must be his intention for me to trust him enduring it. Um, on your way back, stop in 1 Thessalonians chapter 
uh, 3. The Thessalonians with another church. They had heard the gospel in the midst of opposition and suffering, and Paul started out telling them that their testimony uh, in chapter 1 of uh, 1 Thessalonians, they received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, and they became an example throughout Greece, both in northern Greece and southern Greece, Macedonia and Achaia. And what? Their testimony is making an impact. Uh, Come over to chapter 3, verse 13. Um, He's praying for them. And uh, we break into the sentence in verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts. That's the goal. Part of Paul's ministry with the truth. Our ministry to one another and to encourage one another. So that what? We are set firm. And uh, as we go through this, there's a strength. Uh, We like to say, well, boy, I I don't want to have these trials and troubles and difficulties. But you know, everyone we go through helps to strengthen us. Uh, Helps us to be more firmly planted so we are not moved. Um, You're in uh, Thessalonians. You might as well stop at 2 Thessalonians. You just see this repeated emphasis. Now, verse 16 of 2 Thessalonians 2. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself, God and God our Father. This is the work of God the Father and God the Son, who loved us and given, has loved us and given us eternal comfort, good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Um, church is called to serious business. Uh, we need saints that have stability, that stay on course, that are not tottering. Um, this is part of what God is doing. He is confirming, fixing. Uh, come back to uh, Peter. Strengthen, Uh, the end of verse 10, perfect, confirm, strengthen. It's only used here in the New Testament. It means to impart strength, to make strong. It's God's work to, you know, make us strong to stand. Establish, um, establish you. Word that means to give a firm foundation uh, can, uh, used by Paul, uh, translated grounded in Ephesians 3.17. Colossians 1.23, firmly established. You know, God just didn't pile up these uh, verbs here. Uh, talk about the work he does just so we could, uh, you know, yeah, do all that. And fix in our mind. And each of them carries an emphasis. All said and done. Yeah, the people who are rock solid on firm ground with a firm foundation. We've been stabilized on that foundation. We have strength. Um, he has made the adjustments and changes necessary in us. That we are ready to be more usable to him. So the trials and conflicts um, that may come, that may yet be before us, aren't uh, negatives that, I don't know what's going on, I guess I have to just endure it. No, it's more of an adventure than that. God is doing something in my life. In our life as a church, and we want to gain every uh, bit we can from it, learn everything we can, come through it, strengthened and more mature and more ready for whatever comes next. Um, Just note verse 11, the doxology there. 
in chapter 5. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Um, this word dominion means might or sovereign power. And it's his sovereign power. The fact he rules over all that can guarantee that all of this will be accomplished. Um, up in verse 6, we uh, let's see, was it verse 6, chapter 5, verse 6? Yeah, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. That word mighty, um, connected to dominion. Um, it's his might. You know, to him be might. Power, sovereign power forever and ever. Humble yourselves under the sovereign, powerful hand of God. I recognize that's what I want to do. Humble myself under his, the sovereign power of his hand. He's in control. And verse 11, to him be that sovereign power forever. It's a, an assurance, what? Amen. Talked about this word this morning. I mean, it's true. So everything is good. We're ready for tomorrow, whatever it brings. There's nothing going to come into my life that the sovereign God has not planned and prepared for me. And what is so important is I face it and go through it with my eyes fixed on what he has promised and with a desire that his purposes for me will be accomplished and I am willingly humbling myself under his sovereign, all-powerful hand so that he can mold me to be the person that he intends me to be in preparation for the glory that he has promised to me, to you, to us, as his people, let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for all you have provided, all you have promised. It's easy for us to get caught up in the mess of the world, to be distracted and disturbed, even fearful, caused to feel uncertain. But, Lord, we serve you, the God who is sovereign over all. We belong to you. You have promised us glory. You have promised us that all the trials, the difficulties, the opposition, the pain will be sifted by you as part of the process to accomplish what only you can accomplish in molding us into conformity to your character. Lord, I pray that you'll continue your work that we individually and as a church might be strong, that our testimony for you might grow, that we might be used in greater ways. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.